We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Joe, welcome back. Hey, Tom, how are we doing? Good, good. Well, yeah, like um, like I was just saying, I wanted, I wanted to get you back on the show, man, because it's A, just a good opportunity to catch up, but B, your YouTube channel has gone boom. Like, did yeah. you ever expect that was going to happen like that, that fast? <laughs> I did get some help. I'm going to put a shout out to Uber Boyo. Um, I sent them the lecture a couple months ago, last summer. So 2021, when I first started producing the lecture, I sent Uber Boyo the first lecture. He seemed to enjoy it. He shared it with his followers and it got like a little boost. Mm -hmm. And then that was it. And then Uber Boyo and I had a little discussion and then it got another little boost. And then that was it again. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, YouTube just started pushing um, the first two lectures and it was, so I don't have the exact numbers, but it went from maybe a couple thousand impressions a week to a million in a week. And I was just like, whoa, you know, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know exactly what happens. I don't know anyone at YouTube. I don't know, you know, yeah. I'm not paying for anything. So, um, you know, maybe people are watching it. You know what I think it is though? Cause I've had a lot of people reach out. Mm. A lot of people are really waking up to this individuation process to yeah. realizing that self in them and the, the coronavirus, you know, it was tough times, but it really put people back into their self and it really mm. woke up a lot of people. Um, so I think that's what it is. I think it's a topic that's hitting the heart and the longings of a lot of people. And mm. I'm sure this is going to be a uh, discussion in this discussion. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you're exactly right. It's a great place to start because I think, uh, people want want answers actually you know what even deeper than that i think they want their autonomy back you mm -hmm. know and this this is not a you know we're not talking about a political conversation here or there but in a world that is so abundant um you know the western world where we have so many exogenous ways to heal ourselves what the one thing that erodes is our ability to create our own life and which is obviously as you know such an important factor when it comes to psychological well-being um but that was kind of the first thing that i wanted to talk to you about is because i would classify you as an expert in jungian uh psychodynamic psychoanalysis and um i think in our first podcast which people can check out you know we, we spoke about your backstory and what got you involved in in the jungian process and everything but now is kind of a, a real connoisseur of that of that um flavor of psychology uh maybe you could give us a brief rundown of what what it speaks to and you know why it is really booming now in, the, in this day and age yeah, I'll bring it again back to 2020. You know, a lot of people we, before 2020 were out and we're just living in our world and we're living our life and we think everything's normal and we're not really paying attention to the deeper things because we're in the world. But then when something happens and it shakes things up, just like the dark night of the soul, it'll put you in a place where you're stunned and you're looking around and you're wondering, what was that that I was living? You know, what is it that I am living? What am I? Um, and I think a lot of these questions really uh, started coming up in this time period. And, you know, it's been dark, but like I said, it's been light in the sense that a lot of people are starting to wonder. And it's this wondering that really gets people to open. And, and really, that's all it is, because once you start noticing that there's a little bit more to life than the material, than the hardness, um, you know, that gets you curious. And then that's it. From there, your soul kind of takes you off on its own journey. Now, the Jungian material, a lot of people, they like it because there's a lot of terms that are attractive, I guess we'll say, like shadow work. We talked about this last time. It's attractive, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's really difficult work. And I don't think anyone really understands what it means. Um, it's a little bit more than just saying, oh, the stuff that you repressed. Oh, you know, the traumas that you don't want to look at. Um, it goes a little bit deeper than that. And then even deeper than that is the soul. And that's really where I think that, that this whole individuation, this whole process, uh, I think the soul has been reawoken in a lot of people. And they're not sure how to work with it that they see that there's this other thing in them that's alive this other thing that maybe was pushing their attractions and pushing their desires outwardly um that, that is real and maybe mm -hmm. they should take care of it in a sense so i think this 
you know, connecting with the other, um, with the soul and, and the shadow, um, really connected to a lot of people. Now, here's the thing. There's a lot of different psychologies out there and there's a lot of different thoughts and processes. But what I've noticed with Jung is that he connects a lot of them. He has almost the master keys in a sense that if you understand his work, then you can go out into Buddhism and understand Buddhism. You can go out into Christianity and understand the deep roots of Christianity, the Gnostics, and then where I'm going, and this is really where I think Jung holds his value, is all the way back into the Greeks. And I'm talking Plato, even before Plato, Socrates, Empedocles, Parmenides, even Thales, the, the, one of the first Greeks, they speak on the one, and this one is what the self is. So it's really interesting to see that tied into everything. Whoa, yeah, that's cool. Well, could you take us a bit deeper in into the Greeks then? Because yeah, I, I don't really know much about that at all. So yeah, so yeah, this, this is, is now, new this for is me. podcast selfish. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, since last time we talked, I didn't get into the Greeks, and yeah. I, I just started realizing them. There was this YouTube channel on Pierre Grimes. I've talked about him a few times in my lecture, and he talks about Plato, but the spiritual aspect of Plato. So he takes the Republic and he says, instead of using it as analogy to government or towards leadership, you use it as analogy to the soul. And you start seeing this whole journey of, of understanding the soul and the way that they use their dialect, um, you know, is it, just a beautiful way to unleash that self in you, that information that's already in you, those questions that they're asking, like a coach does, they ask questions. So then you stimulate the soul, new things start arising. And that's how you get the intelligence moving. That's how you get the soul moving. But um, what happened was I, I was reading some of these works and I found a translation that picks up the word self. And when you get the word self and you start seeing it, it really helps you open up, especially if you have Jungian terms in you, it really helps you open up to the text. So I'm reading Plato, I'm seeing it in a different way, reading some of um, all the way back into even Parmenides. So his fragments, he has one poem, a couple fragments here and there, mm. um, but it's speaking on nowness. It's speaking on what is, it's speaking on this idea that's really getting popular nowadays. Um, Ed, Ed, Eckhart Tolle, I think yep. he wrote a book, The Power of Now. Yeah. So you see this Greek influence from all the way back, I'm talking 600 BC, mm. playing a part of, of a lot of people's awakening journeys now and the realizing this aspect that is really at the roots of Western civilization. So these are our deepest roots mm. here in the West. Yeah. It, it's interesting. I, um, I was listening to Ram Dass. Ram Dass is a brilliant, uh, as you know, spiritual teacher. And I, I try to use a lot of his ideas in, in therapy as well. And um, he was talking about <laughs> the, the, the orgasm as this idea of, you know, when you're having sex, it's like, oh, keen to have an orgasm and go, here it comes. Here it, these are his words. He goes, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. And then you go, there it goes, there it goes, there it goes. But he says in that space between here it comes and there it goes is this state of pure presence of nothingness where you are really not a someone. You know, no no one is ever saying, oh, it's happening now, it's happening now, because we're just there, we're just embodied. And um, people can find a lot. I think what happens in those states, you know, whether it's through some some sort of psilocybin or psychedelic journey or, or, you know, when you see a wonderful landscape or as you said before, when a coach or a therapist or whatever set probes uh, a question that gives you a, a major reframe is that you have this very significant dissociation, you know, and fragmentation between who you thought you were. And as you're exposed to this reality now, which basically says who you thought you were can't ever have been real this is terrifying because it's very existentially destabilizing, but Jung's idea in the power of individuation is that it's also the, the dawning of potential, you know? So I think that it's, it's very, very, it's very rejuvenating, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And and that word dawning, that's a, um, the word used a lot in, in the Greek, the Greek text, that dawning mm -hmm. of consciousness, that kind of bringing that renewal of, of a new consciousness. But that means that the old consciousness has to die in mm -hmm. order for that new to come through. And, you know, that's really the biggest aspects of the individual individuation journey is removing a lot of that prior programming. It's a difficult process, but you can't see what is if you have what you thought was on top of it. You, mm -hmm. you can't grasp what is. So in order to get to that, what is to the self, 
Um, you got to do a lot of work and that's that purification. It's a beautiful process. It's a beautiful word purification, but then you look at it and you say, wait a second, this is not going to be fun. You know, I'm going to be ripping a lot of things out of myself. I'm going to be pulling things that I was comfortable with out of my life. Um, but if you can keep going, you really do, do start to see that logos and then the arrow starts to come through and it's a whole different experience. And you start to see how the reality you were living was playing off of all these emotions that didn't need to be played with because they're natural and they're real in you. And when you get to know the true emotions in you, I think that's when life really starts to bloom in a sense. Yeah. So, so I've, cause I've got a couple of people at the moment who are moving through this kind of thing. I'd love your insights on it, mate. When, when you're, when someone is moving through the first stages of, as you say, an old consciousness is dying, a new consciousness has to be reborn but they're kind of mediating between those two poles. Um, what's something that can help people um, navigate that process? The big one, because the thing about it, it we're going to bring in the ego. The ego, I think, is the most important thing in this, because if you're trying to kill the ego and then get rid of it and then just be open in this sense to whatever comes through, what comes through might still be something that's distorted by something, you know, in your childhood you don't even know about or maybe your ancestry that you don't know about. Um, so I think it's this idea of re realizing that it's your ego that you're developing and ego is consciousness subjectively to all of us. You and I have the self in us. The self is shared. That's the one that's in all. But then we each have our own individual egos. And it's this ego that's trying to open up to that wholeness, open up to grasp that realness. And it's that ego that's that needs to be developed. So, you know, it, it, I, and I don't mean to you know push people in the sense that, that are believing, you know, this whole ego uh, dissolving this ego. Um, I can't think of the name, ego death, people say. Yeah. But, ego is bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ego is bad. But at least in Jungian terms, ego is just subjective consciousness. And, you know, people say, oh, you know, you have to, you can't, you can't say that, Joseph, because then people are going to have their individual aspects in, in the work. And what I could say is, when you step back, you don't have to get, you, there's a way you can step back and still walk forward. But what's walking you forward really isn't you and your own thoughts. It's what is, in a sense, it's that logos mm -hmm. or that spirit. It's a difficult place to get to, but I like to call it an in-between because I see us in between as the ego, the in-between of the other and, you know, what's here of the spiritual and the material. It's this in-between of mind and of body. And I think the ego, if it can center itself in that middle ground, um, it can really begin that development. If the mm -hmm. ego is not open, if the ego is scared, if the ego is fearful, then it can't really develop into the self, which is wholeness. And if it has judgments, you know, same thing. So I think if anyone's getting this started, really focus in on understanding the ego and then being open to that other, see if you can catch the self. Mm, mm. And, and you, you raise a good point because people do think the ego as just inherently a bad thing, but um, we do need an identity, <laughs> you know, and uh, to not have one is unless you, you know, you're uh, working towards enlightenment and you're happy to renunciate and become a monk. Um, you know, for most of, most of us, that isn't really the, the journey that we, we, we want to take. Um, but so you do need an identity. Otherwise, how do you function? And I think that's the part of the West, you know, the West is sort of that ego. You could say the East is the self. And I think they're both in need of a unification. And this is that unification where the ego is not trying to say, oh, I want this. So I'm going to go out and, and I'm going to go get this. You could try to do that. But there's this other aspect of you that if you're trying to go out and get what you want, but you leave your other self behind, it's never going to fulfill you. Now, if you can walk with that other together and not force it, but let it be, then you'll see that life opens up in a different aspect. And then the synchronicities start popping up and then everything gets a little bit magical. Mm, yeah. That's really cool, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So why don't you talk us through what's going on with your, your YouTube and the lectures and things like that. So mm. did you have a group? I mean, you know, I've listened to a few of them. They're, they're really honestly, man, they're fantastic. I know I, I messaged you when, um, um, after the first one came out for anyone interested, um, humble you media on YouTube. They're really, really great lectures and they're so well produced, mate. Like the, as you talk and the images, it's not just an audio. Um, it's a real journey. You're watching these videos and that, yeah, you really feel involved. So kudos to you for doing that. Cause they're really, really enjoyable. Um, Thank but, uh, 
The uh, yeah, so so why don't you talk us through the first couple of lectures? So it was specifically about Jung's Red Book. Is that right? Yeah, Jung's Red Book. And what I do is I just do Liber Primus. So the Red Book split up into three different books. It's Liber Primus, then Liber Secundus, and then at the end the scrutinies where he really scrutinizes the whole work. It's a beautiful, beautiful yeah. last little piece. But uh, Liber Primus, the reason I did this lecture on Liber Primus is because Liber Primus is about making that connection, beginning to see the self and losing that ego pull, you know, that 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 that, that egoness in you. Uh, being a humble ego and seeing the self. So you see him kind of go through this process of removing things from the world, getting into himself, seeing some of these images arise for the first time. And I wanted to show people that aspect, how they can go through this process to eliminate that old way of living and then reconnect to something new. And then once you connect to that other then you go on your own journey. And I didn't want to, people saying, oh, you should do the whole series, the whole book. But if I did the whole book, that's not, that's his journey, you know, and I wanted people to get to the point where they get their self and then they take their journey. So that's why I did it in that aspect. Um, And then the way it came through was a little bit numinous. I didn't plan on doing it. I have no YouTube page. I was doing uh, material on Instagram, which you've seen. And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden something kind of came through and it was like, you're going to do this series. I was like, what? But it gripped me and it was really weird. You know, looking back, I don't think it was. I, you know, and I'm, I'm very, I'm not like a religious woo woo type. I'm really not. I'm just open to what is. And it was just interesting how the whole series would come to me when I'm writing it and producing it. I was so involved with it. It was like part of me. Um, so maybe that's why you've seen like, wow, oh, you did a lot of work with it. It's because it was part of my life for the whole summer, right. you know, and I would, I would write the script, then I would read it and then I would put it together and, and, and create the, the visuals. But when I'm doing it, I'm not thinking, I'm just kind of mm. letting everything flow. And a lot of artists talk about this. And this is that creative spirit that you can get if you go on this individuation journey mm. and you can really allow it to speak through you. Uh, it's a really powerful way to, to create. So that's the way the series came through. Um, and what I was trying to do real quick, you mentioned there's visuals, there's me talking, and there's a lot of different things going on. I'm trying to present information in a different way to stimulate all the senses, to try, try to show people nice. images, to show the text, um, even music I had in the background. Mm. I gave it a try. Some people didn't like it. I liked all. it. It was good. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Look at the comments. Um, yeah, you'll yeah. See. <laughs> about half of them didn't like the music, but I'm uh, just trying to give yeah. uh, different ideas out there for this kind of material because, <clears throat> uh, you know, a, a lot of people are, are looking for this and it could be a little bit dry. I think a lot of people are looking for this and I think yeah. they're looking for a modern take on it as well, because you've read, I've read a couple of Jung's books. I've not read the red book, um, which I do want to give some context for listeners um, who are new to this stuff um, in, in short, but um, it's the, the, it's amazing how quickly uh, language evolves, isn't it? And I think people need someone like you can make a beacon for that, who can understand his writing and then give it a modern take um, for the contemporary listener um, or, or consumer of Jung's work. So, you know, that's another thing I think that you've really nailed, mate, because you can you um, you simplify it without dulling it down, if you understand what I'm saying, like, which mm-hmm. I think is really great because um, you still want to go in because it's so deep. You know, this is some of the deepest, you know, so, so for context, Jung, as far as I understand, um, you can help us out here was Freud's uh, prodigy, um, his students. And then um, I remember reading about a dream that um, Jung had just prior to Freud and him splitting off where, he, you know, they were excavating a basement and Jung found a, a door that led to a much, much, much deeper, deeper, wider area, um, I think, which was some kind of, you know, um, analogy for the collective unconscious. But did you want to speak about that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, they were having a conversation, maybe a little bit. I don't know the time frame of this dream. I never heard of that dream. Mm. But he's having a conversation with Freud. I think they're at a restaurant. They're somewhere else. And they're talking about the unconscious. And Freud's, you know, sticking with his physical, um, you know, it's just your lifetime and your repressed sexual desires. Sexual desires. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jung's speaking on the spiritual aspect. And he says something about the book on the shelf and the book on the shelf fell off. And he says, see? You know, he was kind of showing you like, hey, I, there, there's other senses out there. There's other spirits mm-hmm. out there. The book falls and the book falls again. It falls twice. Well, wow. um, you know, and, and after that, they split off. And then Jung, then he goes into his red book. So Jung starts the red book 
1913. I believe he broke with Freud 1912, so about a year after. Mm. Um, and then his whole analytical psychology mm. comes out after the Red Book. So I try to show people cool. his whole psychology he lived yes. before he gave it to people. And that's what I love about him because he made sure it's real before he spoke about it. And he's not a sophist just playing with words, which I see a lot of people doing out there. Mm, that's brilliant. That is really yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because the whole, the whole psychology. The whole psychology, exactly. You know, to really live it, uh, there's a, there's a, I mean, the world is always so polarizing and, you know, especially in, in our world. So I've worked as a counselor, psychotherapist, counselor, whatever it is. Um, there's psychologists and, and psychiatrists. And, you know, I've always thought that, you know, if you speak to a surgeon, you're going to get surgery. If you speak to a physio, you're going to get rehab. If you speak to a psychiatrist, you get drugs. You know, obviously I'm stereotyping a lot here, but um, depending on what you want can give you insight as to who you should speak to. And psychotherapy, counseling, analytical psychology, it's much more reflective and experiential. And, um, and I'm biased in that regard because uh, I think it's fantastic. <laughs> but um, I think what's so cool about Jung's side of things is that he actually was using his life as a process of self-discovery um, to then bring about this psychology that was by definition embodied. And he did that work. You know, I've not, again, I've not read the red book and it's one of the reasons why I wanted you to come on today. But mm -hmm. um, from what I understand, he would after dinner, run up into his attic or go into the top of his house and he would sit down and have these images come up and he would try to figure them out and he would mm. speak to God. And he had a friend named Philemus, I think it was. Or Philemon, yeah. Philemon, yeah. Philemon, sorry. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, you know, and, he and that was, was like his logos that was speaking to him, that kind of that other we were talking about. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and he was learning about his mind. He was almost kind of um, mapping the psyche you know, from his own experience, which is wonderful. And, um, and that whole collective unconscious thing I think is wonderful because it makes sense to me that, you know, we've evolved and we have inherited certain biological and genetic predispositions. Why wouldn't the mind have done that too? And I think, you know, from a contemporary, just from a very simple to understand perspective, most people in the world, although they would not necessarily consciously state that, for example, they're scared of spiders. If you see a spider jump at you, we're all going to jump. Now, obviously that's embodied and there's a physiological response to that as well, but we would all have some kind of fear of spiders because our ancestors evolved to become afraid of them because they could kill us. Now, to me, that's one way of understanding the collective unconscious from a very simplified but true um, aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Another good example is religion. You know, religion was first, oh, there's this, there's this God in the sky. And then all of a sudden he came down to earth. There's this man walking on the earth. And what Jung said in his answer to Job is the next phase, you know, the higher level of consciousness is we're all embodying that same, that spirit, mm -hmm. um, the, the, the one in a sense. So, um, you know, the same way. And then real quick, I want to mention this because you, you really brought this up in my head and I never thought of this. A lot of doctors nowadays, they're giving medicine out. A lot of these, especially mental medicine, mm. are they trying it themselves? Because I don't think they have, you know, and, and you think about Jung, he's doing his psychology, trying it out before he gives it to us. Uh, it's a lot mm. of respect that, that I give uh, Jung. And a lot of people, real quick, I do want to mention, he was a psychologist and he was a scientist, but he had to play the part to get this information out. He truly was yeah. a mystic in a sense. Mm. His true roots are mystical, prophetic. Um, and, and he, he was clean. A lot of people I see asking, oh, was he on cocaine? Was he doing LSD? He was very clean during his whole process. So mm. uh, there's a way to access this realm clean. I, I do want to mention. That is a great point. I think yeah. Albert Hoffman, uh, and LSD was 1936 or something around that. I could be wrong. Um, first, first trip without any bias, cause he didn't know it was LSD and it would bring out this, this crazy vision that he had, but you're exactly right. You know, you read, um, in a, uh, in a work by Robert Johnson and his whole thing there was, you know, dreams and, and just what would kind of pop up in, in meditations and things like that. And, you know, my, my, Beyonce is a breathwork meditation teacher. The shit that comes up in that is just insane. So there is this kind of inner, inner being um, that, you know, is cause for, I mean, look, if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, what the fuck are these two people talking about? At the very, very least, 
take away that you have the ability to learn more about yourself and that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like you said, you know, like that, that it's collective. So we all have it in us. If we didn't have that in us, we wouldn't be able to survive. It's such a beautiful aspect to us and it's recording everything. So then when we subjectively live each and every one of us, we're all twisting it in our own ways. And that's why it's so difficult to have the psychologist help the individual because the individual is dynamic. And with psychology, they're trying to find these objectives, but it's so hard when everything's in a sense subjective. Um, And I think there needs to be a little bit more individuality and subjectivity in this in psychology mm. um, but that's just a personal theory no mate it's it's my theory as well i think um, you know you should never look at someone as and say you can fix them you know because we're all so different and um and also if you try to fix someone you take away their journey and that the journey is the life you know so you're taking away their that soul you know it sucks you don't want to do that you know <laughs> Yeah. And uh, that's a, it's a huge problem in therapy. Um, and I'm problem. sure you've dealt with it too. A lot of the projections come out on you. Mm, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, so why don't you take us through the red book? Cause I know a lot of people would be really interested in this. So what's going on. So he's writing this book, um, 1930 and you say he starts writing it, it takes him about four years from memory. Is that right? Or maybe longer. He, he, he was writing it into the, I'm trying to think of the last black book entry. It's either the early thirties or oh, wow. the early twenties. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so it's kind of like his just his personal diary almost. It's his, yeah, it's his personal diary. He oh, called cool. it his experiment with his unconscious. That is cool. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So what are some takeaways um as you read as you read it? Because I know it's his own journey and stuff, but there must surely be some huge nuggets of wisdom that come from that. Like what are some big things that kind of pop off the top of your head? much let me think i think that one of the main things is is in his first visions he's talking about logos and arrows and it's this aspect that i see in everything now that i see it i see it in everything so every archetype if you think about an archetype every archetype has a sense of intelligence in it which is a logos and then every archetype has a sense of agency in it you know the agency is the archetype kind of comes through whenever it wants to it, it might be projected out because you've seen something in the world or it might just come through on its own um it, there's an agency to it so that's kind of that that eros and it's like everything in this world has to have some kind of energy and some kind of intelligence in it for us yes. to know it <clears throat> so it was like this connection of seeing that and then that helped me see a lot of different things in my own life and in my own uh, the, the the archetypes of my own self you know i'm wondering what's the intelligence behind this what's the energy behind this and that just simple formula really helps and then to see jung 1913 speaking about it you know it's just beautiful um mm-hmm. another thing is this aspect of individuation it's such an interesting word um but I'm finally understanding it. Individuation isn't becoming an individual. It's becoming the one. But if you know the one, the one is the all. It's wholeness. So individuation is a road towards wholeness. And it's a, um, that's why he, he calls it individuation, because you're trying to be that one, the kind of the one in everything. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is, like I said, it's broken up into three different sections, but in every chapter, what he'll have is he'll have his visions and then under it, there's a second layer. It's a number two. There's only one reference to call it a second layer. You have to find it in the beginning, but these second layers are where Jung goes back and now he does his own psychological evaluation on his visions. And that's where the gold is, you know, because you can read the visions and they're great. And once you start picking up on the symbolism, you can really have fun with the visions. Um, But man, when he goes in and he starts interpreting his own dreams and his own talks, that's what's really important. And I want people to know that what he was doing was active imagination. So what he would do, what he would focus, I'll give you one example, focus on digging a hole. So he's putting that in his mind, digging a hole, he's focusing on it. And then he, he allows the image to come through. And then he's consciously in the dream, but he's not forcing he's not choosing the dream he's just in the dream as in living in the dream living in the imagery and having these conversations back and forth with what shows up and then he would try to figure out what's the essence of that that just showed up Mm. um one he had the red one that was the devil his own personal devil which he saw so then he makes all the connections connects the emotion to it and understands what the logo is through it um 
So yeah, they're, 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 they're the basic parts. And then there's two different versions of the Red Book for anyone interested in purchasing it. There's a smaller version. It's only a $20 or $30 purchase. And it's a little Red Book. It looks like a Bible. I actually have it with me right here. And um, hey. you see, it's just like a Bible. Cool. And yeah. uh, it's really not a bad read. And um, what I would recommend if anyone does buy it is to, to go into the appendices at the end and you'll see a lot of gold. Now, mm. there's also a, another edition of the book. It's the Philemon version. And it's like a textbook. I have the black book here. It's about the size of it. And you can see it's Oh, huge. yeah. Cool. Cool. <laughs> so, wow. Um, so, yeah. So that's... That's for anyone that's really interested in seeing the imagery. So if you yeah. want to get the good look on the imagery, you get the bigger book. If you want to get a good reading, you want to read the red book, get the reader's edition. Now, one thing real quick I do want to show you is you were talking about how Jung mapped the soul. Mm. And I have his mapping of the soul. The only thing is. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, you know what? I don't have it in front of me. I thought I had it. I was going to show you his whole map of the of, of not the soul, the psyche, which is the soul. Yeah, um, yeah, and it's so beautiful because what you said is exactly what he did. He has this work that's in the red book all the way at the end in scrutinies, and it's the seven sermons to the dead, and he gives seven different sermons to the dead, who are the shadows, uh, what has passed, we'll call it. And during these sermons, he really speaks about the whole cosmology of the psyche. He talks about God. He talks about us as man. And he talks about the whole um, cosmos and, and what it is. And um, it, it's a really beautiful section if anyone's interested. And then that mapping that I was going to show you was the whole map of, of the seven sermons, kind of so you could see it. You see the fullness. You see the emptiness. You see the light. You see the dark. You see all these different aspects of psyche mm -hmm. in it. So, um <laughs> you said, oh, give me a couple of things. Yeah. I gave you about 25,000 things. But That's what I want. Go. Yeah. Go. Well, I mean, so you, you mentioned something before, which I thought was really, it just popped up into uh, my mind. Um, Logos and Eros, which I believe is Greek for truth and love. Yeah. I think that's oh, some yeah. kind of, yeah. Which, which, yeah. which to me is therefore just another representation of yin and yang, you know, yes and no light and dark. And I, um, it's funny, you know, when you hear about, so this is what's, what's so interesting to me about the whole spirituality and science thing. I was having a conversation with another um, clinician this morning, friend, and we were talking about how science, so, science is the, the thing right now, you know, prior to science, it was philosophy might've been alchemy before that astrology, you know, going all the way back to uh, myth. And, and then even before myth, we just embodied it, you know, before we could actually talk about what we were doing, we were just dancing, you know? Um, yeah. But uh, right now science is the big thing. And obviously if you just look in at, at history, um, there's going to be something after science that's going to be even more accurate than science. Um, you know, some of us can't really see beyond that, but it's just, obviously going to happen. Science is just really big right now. Um, there's always a lag with science. And I think what's so cool about, you know, the mystics and the spiritual people is that they're on the frontiers, you know, and 99% of what they say is total bullshit, <laughs> but 1% trickles through. And then in 20 years time, well, then you've got your lab reports and science can back it up with sample sizes and significant outcomes, non-significant outcomes, you know, things to that degree. But there's always a lag. And when you read lab reports, and I just come from a psych, psych science um, um, uh, tertiary degree, there is a lag. And what's proven right now, you know, is kind of almost old, you know, because it's been around for so long. And what's new now that's only just, you know, so you take the case for EMDR right now, which is eye movement desensitization. I can't remember. Um, reprocessing which is a, is a, is a, is a therapy that treats trauma that kind of mimics the fast, the rapid eye movement cycle, sleep cycle. Um, but it's a way to process to distract the brain so that the trauma can pop up and then be reprocessed without re-traumatizing the individual. That's still woo woo in the scientific literature, but it's actually been around since the late eighties. Now you're talking eighties. Yes. Yes. Whoa. Yeah, 88, 89, I think some of the first documented. So that's 30 years. 
almost 25 years, you know, yeah. but it's still considered woo-woo in the scientific literature. But um, now you look what's coming up, psychedelics, and there's a resurgence of this kind of analytical psychological component, which is obviously what we're talking about. This is the frontier stuff, but you're only going to read about it and, and society is only going to love it because it's conventional and it's tried and true like CBT, you know, in 20 years, 30 years. Mm-hmm. So I think mm-hmm. um, it's so important to keep an open mind. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe that's kind of some of the stuff that we're missing that people are, you know, as you said, in reference to 2020, people kind of really want this, this, this new thing. Yeah. Yeah, it, it got them out of their days, their hypnosis. And now they're like, wait, what is this? Let me figure this out. You said something. I think I just lost it now that I just said that. <laughs> you said something. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I lost it. Uh, <laughs> I lost it. I mean, I could give you something else. Yeah. I lost that. So I want to give you this. You're talking about the dreams and, and uh, you know, the dreams are coming up and a lot of people are now interested in their dreams. Mm. The original Again, back to the Greeks, they were doing these dream, they were called incubations. So they would do these incubations where they would sit in a dark space and they would be basically dead, you know, for days. They would sit there and they would allow, you know, the spirit to speak with them. But these people like Empedocles, like Parmenides, they were practicing these ancient dreams and they were speaking about the power of dreams. You look in the Bible, they speak about dreams all the time and it's like, wait a second, there really is something to these dreams. And then when you look at your dreams and you really map them out, you say, oh, okay, I see what they're trying to hint at because there Mm -hmm. is some truth in there. And it's speaking right to that other that we were talking about. And I just remembered what you spoke on. So uh, what's next after science? I think it's that realm of the collective, you know, it's mm-hmm. that microscopic, the quantum that we're trying to get to, you know, we're, we're, we're breaking through it, but I think there's something that keeps everything in order. There's something further than, mm-hmm. than physics. Maybe it's the quantum and maybe what the quantum is, is connected to that collective psyche. You know, I remember hearing stories way back where in Alaska, there would be storms in Northern Alaska and the people were so connected that they knew in Southern Alaska, just from their mind that something was coming. They would get like messages maybe from uh, Northern tribes or people that they knew in the North. Mm-hmm. And there was just such a connection that there used to be in the world. And we've been just so desensitized to that truth, to that consciousness, um, that we've lost it. And I feel like now people are starting to get a little taste of it, a little mm-hmm. taste. And then once you get a taste, you start, you, you know, you go off and you gotta be careful because there's a lot of ways that you can get yourself tied up in, in some things and, and totally. get yourself a little confused. But, um, you know, if, if you're already living in an illusion, what's worse than another illusion? So if, sure. it's not like you're not going to, it's going to be another illusion. Um, but there is some truth out there. And uh, I believe, I believe people are starting to pick up on it. Yeah. Well, you, so that's a really good point. I think, um, you know, when you're talking about, uh, th- I mean, that was my own personal journey, actually, when I started reading Carl Jung, uh, I'd already had massive changes to my life. I was living in Bali. Uh, I had no routine. My, my sense of identity had died, um, because I wasn't, you know, playing football anymore. And uh, lots of things were coming up that I was really struggling with. And then I started reading. So I was already kind of in that volatile end of the spectrum of, you know, you know, what's, what's my routine and structure identity. And then like, who am I, the unconscious, et cetera. So I was already over there. And then I started reading Carl Jung and I kind of went crazy for a couple of months and it was terrifying. You know, my dreams were more real than, than life. Um, I was constantly having, um, paralyzing nightmares. Um, there was so much, a lot of symbolism and things that just really scared me. And I, I didn't really have a, a solid foundation. And one thing that I try to speak to clients about um, is because sometimes, sometimes this happens involuntarily, you know, death of a loved one um, betrayed in, a, in an, an affair or being cheated on or um, losing your job, COVID, you know, and you have this massive break between who you thought you were and who you obviously are because it's like, Oh, I'm, I thought I was a happily married husband, but then she cheated on me. And it's like, who am I now? And you know, it's like, that's really scary. And this, you have this massive fracture when to then go into take a full dive into Jung's work, in my opinion, I'd love for you to speak on this is, uh, 
it can be too destabilizing. So I think what you need sometimes is let's find a, a, a boring state of normalcy. Let's get you a routine. Let's get a new job. You know, let's just get so we can stand in the world. You know, at least you've got something to go off and then use Jung's work as an example to kind of just open, gently open Pandora's box and just take one thing out at a time. So you don't be go insane. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I know what you mean. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I could see you, you know, going into it when you're in the mass of Confusa, it could really set you off. I didn't go into it in the mass of Confusa. I wasn't in a disoriented state. I kind of caught him after I went through my own individuation journey mm -hmm. or I'm still on it, but I caught him a little bit after and then connected my experiences with him. And that's why I felt so right. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, that, that's a great point. I'm glad you said that because a lot of people, when they, when they're at their most desperate, that's when yeah. they're looking for something and then they'll find someone like Jung or they'll find one of these spirits people on Instagram, mm. we're gonna, you know, we're not gonna talk about them. Yeah, but, you know. <laughs> yes. No, but, but, you know, there's a lot of innocent people that are looking for truth, and and that's the most vulnerable place. Yeah. And and it's so easy when you're in that space to give yourself to something when you don't even know what you're doing. And that's why I brought up the ego earlier. What what, what can somebody look at? What can somebody know on their journey with their, if they're just about to get into it? It's this mm. ego that you have to have this development psychologically, yeah. and and it's little things like what I used to do to build my. Uh, a, a lower anxieties or build a lack of fear was to just go out in the world and do it. So if mm. I was nervous in front of people, I would just go out and talk in front of people mm. or go up to people um, and push myself. You saw a video where I wore a whole scuba sieve outfit and walked yeah, on the yeah, beach yeah. just to see, you know, just to see if I can walk and, and do that because those outer uh, experiences are just as real internally for you. And if you're pushing that, you're actually developing yourself and then you can handle some more fearful situations and you can mm -hmm. handle things. So um, there's ways that you can develop yourself um, to, to take on this work. And I think that's what the alchemist really spoke on was the great work and, and being the adept and be initiated into the work, um, you know, requires another. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that other, you're like you said, you can get completely lost and, and taken away. Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly right. And, you know, it, it's too far on one end, too far on the other end is, is really damaging because there's also a lot of, like wonderful things about being human, like eating too much pizza, getting drunk with your mates, like watching the footy or, you know, just having a job. I think that the, you know, to use your point about the, you know, the spiritual people on Instagram, et cetera, and stuff. And, you know, obviously everyone's different, but um, I suppose the cult of what it is to just be spiritual and everything else about societal convention is terrible. It's like you need, you need both. You need to, I mean, part of the function of, of a proper adult is someone who has reclaimed their individuality and can integrate that into society because society is also life sustaining. And, you know, there's a reason why thou shalt not kill is still an accepted idea because we shouldn't kill people, <laughs> you know, and you need, you need to have, you know, you need to have, structure and routine because the other side to this is that we are primates wearing shoes you know we're not we're not we're part soul you know to use that that word and and you know we we have this incredible ability to be, you know become more and more enlightened as a process of reading and speaking and learning more and humbling ourselves but then the other side is it's like yeah we like to watch netflix chill out <laughs> all that kind of thing yeah yeah and, and, you know, if you don't have yourself with you, like we said earlier, things that come up, you might act out on it. It's like, oh, I'm going to kill my ego. So I'm just going to go with what comes up. And then what if something comes up like, hey, go murder someone? Yeah. Then what? You know? And I was trying to tell someone that was a little bit more Eastern this, that you need that ego to be humble and to develop through the work and work with yourself. And I just don't see how you can just let things go because then we'll go right back to primal conditions where we're eating each other and yeah. we're doing nasty things to children. And, you know, we don't need that in our society. Mm. We work too hard as a, as, a, as a humanity to get to where we are today. Yeah, well, that's a great point, man. I think that was one thing that Eckhart Tolle wrote about in The Power of Now. He said what's, what's going on now is phenomenal because, uh, you know, prior to this this new age, you know, and I mean, age from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, when we were primates and stuff, we were in the Garden of Eden because we were just ignorant, lovingly ignorant. And we were, it was heaven because we didn't know what was going on. And now we are self-aware, which is terrifying because, 
you know, and you kicked out of the Garden of Eden, you're aware of your own vulnerabilities. But then what's coming next is this ability to live in that enlightened state, but also be aware at the same time. So it's that transcending consciousness component, which is, I mean, I'm so miles and miles and miles away from that. <laughs> I mean, we could probably name on about you know, one hand, the people who managed to get there. If but, that. Uh, yeah, exactly. If that, yeah, yeah. But uh, <laughs> hopefully as we continue to grow and evolve as a society and individuals, we can, we can move towards there. It seems like that's where we're going. And, mm. um, you know, it's going to be dark times right now because it seems like it's this transition period. Now, mm. how long is it going to be? It could be hundreds of years. Who knows? But um, you could definitely feel in the air things are a little bit different. People are taking life differently, interested in new things. And um, it, it, the old sense of the world really is in our eyes uh, shifting. So mm. really interesting times to live. And, uh, you know, mm. at least for me, I got Jung to help me <laughs> stay connected to myself through the, through the chaos. Yeah. Yeah. So Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, your business? Like, so what do you actually, cause this content is exceptional, mate. If, if all you do is create more content, I'm a happy man because I get to learn from you, <laughs> but um, how are there any other ways that people can benefit from, from what you're doing? Yeah. I, I work with individuals. Now I've been cutting that back a bit because of the, the videos. It takes a lot of time to, to create a video. Mm. Um, so I've, I've held back on the individuals, but I am starting to think about doing group coaching uh, cool. or group lessons. So maybe for a week, I'll cover uh, ION or for a week, I'll cover the red book and I'll do it live. I just got this little pad where you could write on it. So I'm starting to play around with that. And, Is that remarkable? Uh, Is that what it's called? No, it's a uh, oh. we come. Oh, we okay, come. cool. It's like a little black. It's cool. It's really cool. And it's just a pad. So it's, it's just, you know, just straight. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, there's not a screen on it. And then the screens, the, the computer screen. So you kind of draw on the computer screen. I don't know. It's, it's not bad, but I feel like I can, because what I like to do is I like to, to just show, even if it's not an exact replica, just show the imagery. So I'm working on ion and mm -hmm. there's a part in ion where he's talking about this little echinaeus fish that the alchemists were interested in because it had this, it had this uh, magnetic ability to cause a, a vessel to, to stop in its tracks to, to, to come to a standstill. So just to, to draw it out and then draw the fish and kind of just do a couple of things and then put the labels on it. So the fish, this is the self, the vessel, this is the ego. And then you can kind of see it psychologically. So then you could really incorporate the information because when you're reading Jung, he writes, <laughs> he writes it where you, you just, you have to kind of stop and read yes. in, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I on blew my head open when he was talking about how Jesus was crucified between two representations of good and evil and what that means for the self and the quaternity of the cross. And, you know, this is obviously very esoteric stuff now. So um, if anyone's interested, Ion's a fantastic book, but it's terrifying because <laughs> it makes you, it was like when I read, um, so I got all of this from Jordan Peterson and he was talking about um, beyond good and evil by Frederick Nietzsche. And I read that as well. And that was terrifying. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's not even a book. Like you read like these, like, like 50 word paragraphs and every one of them, you have to stop and go, well, I can't live life like that anymore. And you have to stop and, Oh man, it's crazy, crazy reading. Yeah. Yeah. I think they write in the way to make, like if people really want to know what they're trying to say, that they have to stop and really read it. So it like concretizes into their consciousness, because if you read something once, you'll remember it maybe for a day or two and then it goes away. But when you read something a hundred times, it's never going away. It's like mm. ingrained in you. So I feel like some of these writers like Nietzsche is the same way. It's like you read a sentence and you have to read it back maybe a few times, maybe smack your head over the book a few times before you could start understanding <laughs> what the heck's even going on. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're, you know, they're beautiful, beautiful texts beyond good and evil. It's another one that really mm. shook me. Yeah. 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 So you're working on, um, I own now as a lecture. So uh, <laughs> it's not a lecture, but it's just on one chapter in it. And um, the way it came through was a little bit numinous. I had a voice that said, oh, hey, go, go, go look at the first Greek philosopher. That's Thales. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at him. He's talking about moisture. And then he started talking about how there's a, how the magnet can attract iron and move iron. And there must be a soul in it. There must be something in it that's being able to move it. So then I'm like, wait a second, that's an ion. So then I went to ion and I'm like, maybe this is where um, I, I should go. So I made the video on this, just this one specific chapter. It talks about individuation. But um, 
you know, Ion is uh, something you don't want to read unless you truly know Jung and, and kind of know astrology and, and some other things too. Mm. Yeah, I certainly had to read. I, when I read it, it took me a long time to read because I had to read his other works to figure out what he was talking about because that was a deep, deep, deep book. <laughs> so it's like it's you read one sentence and there's like four to seven different Jungian specific references and jargon. And it's like, okay, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> and then he starts with, so he starts with, it goes ego. And you're like, oh, this is, this is easy. He's talking about the ego. Then he goes to self and you're like, all right. This, and I'm sorry, not self shadow. And you're yeah. like, oh, I love shadow. And then it goes anima and animus and it's the soul, but people are now getting a little confused and then it's self. And then after that, it's like Nostradamus astrology, you know, the structure dynamic of the self. So it gets a little crazy. Um, but then there's other of his works like, uh, man and a symbol, a little bit mm. more easier to understand, and a really great, great book to start with uh, for Jung. So, mm. um, yeah, yeah. So, what's coming up for you then? So, just continuing with the lecture series, and yeah, I know, I know you're big in what's going to be coming through you and that that flow state idea. But uh, do you have any uh, goals or desires with where you you think it might take you? Yeah. Uh, I honestly want to create material to get people back to their self, to help people see through and to um, inspire people to, to begin to take their self serious. Uh, I really don't do this for myself. I, I, again, worked on TV before. If I wanted the attention, I would have just stayed on the news. Mm. Um, I really do this just to get the information out. I feel like it really helped me on my journey and it seems to connect with a lot of people. So um, hopefully I'll do some speaking engagements too in the right. future now that things are opening up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, just living the life. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Awesome. Well, hey, um, I suppose we should, um, yeah, direct people to the YouTube channel. Is it Humble You Media? That's it. Humble you media. Awesome. And then you is just the letter U. Yes. It's not why are you? Yeah. Yeah. So cool, mate. It's always so fun to, to catch up with you. And I love, I love following your journey because I, you know, from a selfish perspective, I get to, to, to learn from it. So it's, uh, it's really fantastic. And I really thank you so much. I've been um, on your podcast now two times and overall in the past two years, I've only been invited on a few podcasts. So I do appreciate you. I really love our connection. Um, mm. We've been connected for now a year or so. And, um, you know, I'm just uh, grateful that there's people like you out there trying to get this information into the world. So thank you. Yeah, mate, mate, right back at you. Well, yeah, guys, as I said, you know, please check out Joe's stuff on uh, Humble You Media because it is just, it's really fantastic. And, you know, I mean, the good thing about this day and age is, you know, a lot of us have commutes and things, so you can listen to it when you're driving or chuck it in and listen to it as a podcast. It's well worth the watch as well if you want to just make lunch <laughs> and dinner and, <laughs> and check it out as you do. But um, fantastic insights, you know, from from um, just a brilliant mind in the name of, Carl Jung. And, you know, I think when it comes to psychology, it should be a process of learning more about your mind and how you want to live. Because at the end of the day, you know, there's, there's a million words for what we all do, you know, whether you're a content creator or you're a therapist, a psychologist, a clinician, a psychotherapist, a coach, whatever the fuck you want to call it yourself. But hopefully if they're all doing the right thing, they're trying to help you find a sense of fulfillment, which can only come from how you personally want to create the world that you live for the time that you have. And, uh, you know, Joe's certainly doing that with, 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 with kind of the stuff that he's putting out. So couldn't recommend it more. Um, and yeah, mate, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate you real quick on Tom's page. He has this amazing video of one of the greatest people in the world. His name's Wim Hof. And I'm sure, you know, Wim Hof, but <laughs> I saw him. I saw you drumming with Wim Hof and I'm like, wait a second. I knew Wim Hof before Jung. Like, yeah. Wim Hof, you were saying how the breathing, your, your fiance, was it your fiance or girl? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fiance, how, mm. how the, you know, the images and the dream and the symbols are coming through. And, and then that's what really got me was Wim Hof's breathing method. Mm. That's what connected me to myself. And I started picking up on that realm before I even knew Jung. So yeah, uh, yeah check out Tom's channel. He's got that cool video on there. Yeah, both playing a song. <laughs> that was good fun. <laughs> yeah, well, guys, uh, thanks so much for tuning in and uh, I'll speak to you next week. Bye.